Welcome everyone. Please silence your cell phones before worship begins. Just a little bit of business uh, detail before we begin worship. Uh, the restrooms are located through the door um, by the pianist Bobby here down the stairs. The men's restroom is located in the courtyard outside. And there's also a changing table for infants in the nursery, which is also in the outside courtyard. Um, if, you, if everyone could please protect, uh, provide your name and contact info, even if you have done so before, uh, this is how the office follows up with everyone. And the Lincoln Methodist women will meet for lunch at 11 a.m. on Thursday, June 8th um, at Meridian's. Please RSVP this a penny if you're planning to attend. And the Reasonable Faith is scheduled for Thursday, June 8th at 6.30. If you guys haven't come before, it's a, it's a great, great time, very, a lot of great information. Uh, are there any other announcements today? I've got one, just a correction on the Reasonable Faith. Oh, um, <laughs> we are going to know it, that um, you come, so it's great. I'm glad you gave a little plug there for that. Um, we're gonna switch the date to the 22nd. I believe that's not, it's in uh, three weeks, I think. I don't have my phone on me, so I can't remember. I will send out an email to all, uh, all of you that already attend, and we'll look, put it in the e-notes so that they'll have the date. Um, if you haven't been coming to Reasonable Faith, I encourage you to come to this one. Um, we're gonna be talking about how we can show the existence of God by pointing to morality, right, wrong, good, and bad. So we're gonna be talking about how morality and ethics are evidences for the existence of God. And it's a really, a, it's, a, it's gonna be a fun time. So if you can come, I encourage you at 6.30 here at the chapel, uh, the 22nd. Now time for the call to worship. I will read the words in white and you guys will read the words in yellow. We arise today. We arise today. Through belief in the threeness, let us arise to worship. Amen. Well, it's so good to see you all this morning. Won't you, if you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing the hymn, We Believe in One True God. Throughout the earth, you made your glory higher than heaven. 
From the mouths of nurse and baby babies, you have laid a strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful and enemies. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet, all sheep and all cattle, the wild animals too, the birds in the sky, the fish in the ocean, everything that travels the pathways of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Well, won't you join me as we say uh, together these words of the people? God, our Father, our Creator, who made the heavens and the earth, we are your children, and we are in awe of all that you have made. Christ the Son, our Redeemer and Savior, you live and died for us all. You live again and prepare the way for us. O Holy Spirit, the sustainer, you move in us and among us. We follow your wisdom and feel your presence. God, try you, three in one. Help us to know you more fully. Guide us in this time of worship. Amen. 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 Well, at this time, I invite you to pass the peace with one another. There's some big faces out there. It's not so big. <laughs> Around the room. She's peaceful. Thank you. 
Let us go ahead and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. comes from Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, the, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Well, it is good to be back. Thank you for your wonderful participation last week. Even when the teacher was away, the substitute teacher said the class was still here and things didn't get out of hand. Um, but thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed Stephen and his family. He enjoyed uh, being here, being with you. My wife and I had a lovely time. We've never been out to Pismo Beach. How many of you have been over there to Pismo Beach before? Yes, yeah, so you know. I don't know if I can do the clouds every morning. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the East Coast. Um, but it was beautiful nonetheless. They obviously, obviously the clouds disperse um, later in the day. But we had a wonderful time uh, together and definitely were refreshed. It was one of those vacations where you're refreshed. Amen. You know those vacations where it's like you get back and you need a vacation? Th this was not one of those. This was an actual vacation. We actually felt refreshed because my wife and I know how to party and relax. Really. So, yeah. Yeah, we had a great time. Well, today, if you hadn't caught on, there's been a theme. There's been a theme, and the theme today has been the Trinity. I've been hearing it in the songs, Holy, 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 God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. And Bishop Barron in the video spoke of the Trinity. Hopefully that was helpful and began to sink into your hearts as we were, think as we're thinking about and want to think some more about this aspect of God as Trinity. It was in our prayer. Uh, for those of you that know, we have a liturgical calendar. Uh, Christians have always, from the beginning, marked time with significance, holy significance. Now, today in America, we mark time with significance in terms of consumerism. So, you know, we have days that kind of get us shopping, right? This is when the sale is, this is when the party is. Uh, but in the Christian calendar, there's something called holy days. Not holly days, but holy days. And that was an ancient Christian technique to help people think about time. Not just as time for partying, time for doing whatever, time for shopping, even, even appropriate times like time for marking national holidays, right? But there was also time for God, and everything was penetrated and interpenetrated in the liturgical calendar for, when it came to God being involved. And we've just gone through a very significant time, haven't we? We've gone through the time of Christmas, Advent, and we move into Lent. And then we move into Easter. And then we move through Pentecost, right? These are the high holy days of the Christian year. And it's during these times we're invited to live into the gospel story. And now we're about to enter into what's known as ordinary time. The next half of the year. Think of it this way. If for one half of the year we're facing God in the word, focusing on the gospel story. Well, ordinary time, the next part of the calendar is when we face the world now and live the gospel. Are you with me? Having lived the gospel story, Christmas, the birth of Christ, his life, his teachings, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the spirit of God coming down on Pentecost, which we all celebrated last week. Now we're about to enter ordinary time. But before we do, we have put before us the Trinity. Why? 
Because I believe in order to fully live the gospel, in order to turn to the world and be the good that we need to be to our neighbor, we need to have an understanding of God and all God's fullness. How you think about God is how you think about everything. How you understand God is how you understand everything. And your idea of God will affect how you live in the world. And so it's quite appropriate that it's at this moment the church calendar comes to us and says, this is Trinity Sunday. This is the time now to, in some level, begin to try to have an appreciation for the fullness, the grandeur, the majesty of who God is in Christ. And so that's what we want to do. Now, today's passage is known as the Great Commission. When Chantal just read the second scripture, was it familiar to some of you? Yeah, you've heard that verse before, right? It's often known as the Great Commission. It's where Jesus commissions his disciples to go and to make disciples of all the nations. Beyond the borders of Israel, to the whole world. That Jesus wants people to live with him in God's kingdom now. God's world now. Receiving and growing in the life that only he, as the universal king, can give. That's why Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. He has received universal authority from God the Father. Therefore, he is the universal Lord. So how were the disciples to respond to this reality? Well, notice in verse 19, it says, therefore, go... In light of the fact that I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, okay, in light of that fact, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. Let me just stop there. Can you imagine if churches actually teach the things that Jesus taught to its people? Rather than always focusing on things that can be very divisive, huh? things that can be very, uh, almost very ideologically driven, or things that kind of create more division. Imagine the church focused on teaching, or pastors really, focused on teaching people to do the things Jesus taught. Wow. Wow. What would the church look like? And that's what Jesus is asking, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Look. I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. So Jesus shares his authority, beloved, with his people so that they may bring others into the authority of his kingdom. I know some of us get scared sometimes when we hear the idea of authority, but authority is good when it's rooted in truth. Authority is good when it's rooted in justice. Authority is good when it's rooted in love. And this is the kind of authority Christ is inviting people into. The authority of God is life-giving. It's the authority of his kingdom. It's the authority where God's will is done on earth as it is done completely in heaven. So Jesus shares his authority with his people so that they may bring others into the authority of his kingdom where God's life and justice and truth and love reign. Jesus is commissioning his followers. We see that. He's commissioning them to go and to save the world. Right now, churches are hoping that people will come in and save the church. We kind of have things backwards, don't we? But I believe that's because we've lost sight of who God is and what he has called us to do. Instead of focusing on politically divisive issues, the church, I believe, should be focusing on who God is and what he has done in order for us to know who we are in him and what he has called us to do. And today's passage helps us, helps you and I, to reclaim these things. Notice Jesus tells them to go and to what? To make disciples, students, think of it, uh, or apprentices, I like that word, to make apprentices of who? Who? All nations. This is a transnational, trans-ethnic movement. This would have been very uh, radical, in a way, to the Jews who were just focused on Israel. But Jesus is expanding their perspective, and he's helping them to see that what he has done has universal significance. 
This points to a new reality God was doing that required his Jewish followers to not only head out on mission, but to enter new places. New places, maybe uncomfortable places, foreign places, places where they weren't so sure in terms of what to do. Places they would undoubtedly have felt uncomfortable among the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations. As they did this, they were to do what? What were they to do? They were to make converts? No. They were to make disciples. A convert's just someone who may, you know, say a prayer and that's it. A disciple is someone who is learning day by day to conform their life to Jesus Christ and God's way and God's kingdom. And so Jesus is asking, telling his disciples to go and to make apprentices. How? How? What does the verse say? How do they do this? By baptizing them in the name of the Trinity. And teaching them Jesus' commands, counting on Jesus' ongoing presence with them until he returns. Look closely, look closely. How are disciples made? How are they made? How are Jesus' people made? They're made by baptism and by teaching. By baptism and by teaching. Teaching is very important. You probably figured out that Dr. Elkins has a teacher's bent, doesn't he, last week? <laughs> I heard he gave you some information, right? He likes to teach. He's like me. I'm a very didactic teacher. That's what you got when they sent me here to Lincoln. You got a didactic pastor, right? Some pastors are very storyteller. Some pastors like to run around on the stage. Some pastors like to come down in the congregation. You like those kind of speakers where they're coming in and talking? And like, yeah. <laughs> some of you love it. Some of you are like, no, I'm never coming back to that church again. <laughs> right? I'm didactic. There's a value in teaching, and teaching is very important. But here, teaching is connected with what Jesus had specifically taught his disciples. It's, we see those teachings really in the whole Bible, of course, but specifically we see them in the Gospels and in the New Testament as well. But something is needed in addition to teaching, and that's baptism. Matter of fact, we have baptism in place of the, at the head, don't we? Baptizing people first in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them all that I have commanded you. What in the world does baptism in the name of the Trinity mean? I mean, we have a hard enough time thinking about the Trinity, and we'll get to that in a moment. But what does it mean to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, of course, I think it means placing people into a new relationship defined by God's authority. That's what it means to, in the name of something means, in the authority of the one who bears the name. So in some sense, baptism is bringing someone into the kingdom of God, into the authority of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's something more here. I want you to... Listen to this, uh, these words um, rewritten by Dallas Willard. I like to talk about Dallas Willard every now and then. Dallas Willard translates this verse in this way. And he helps us to see this one thing that I want you to kind of think about and enter into this morning. Look at what he says. This is him recasting the verse. I have been given say over all things in heaven and on earth. As you go, as you go, therefore make disciples of all kinds of people, submerge them in Trinitarian presence. Notice those words. Submerge them in Trinitarian presence and show them how to do everything I have commanded. And now look, I am with you every minute until the job is done. A beautiful passage. It's a beautiful rewording of this passage. But something that he says here kind of awakens us to a, another reality that I want us to think about. And it's the phrase, it's seen in the phrase, submerge them in Trinitarian presence. Submerge them in Trinitarian presence. See, baptism is not just about our new life in God. It's also about awakening to the fact that all that God is, is now surrounding you. 
All that God is, is right now and will continue to surround you. You are submerged in Trinitarian presence. We're all to be like Christ. We're all to be a people bathed in the fullness of God. And I believe if we lack that kind of holistic character and experience in our day-to-day -day lives, then the teachings of Christ won't matter. At least they won't be lived in the sense, they're not going to matter in the sense that we're just not going to live them in our lives. If we're not submerged in Trinitarian presence, if we don't understand the fullness of God, if we don't understand the treasures that you and I have in the fullness of the Trinity, we're not taking in God as King, we're not going to live kingdom teachings and we're not going to experience kingdom blessing. Does that make sense? Do you see the connection between baptism, our Lord's teaching, uh, between baptism and teaching? Like the mystics of old were all called to be a God-intoxicated people rooted deeply in the Trinity and the eternal life that Christ came to bring. But people trip up, don't they, when you say the word Trinity? Maybe today you're thinking, wow. People trip up. Just like Bishop Barron just said in the video, people here, they asked a bunch of medieval mumbo jumbo. You know, three persons, one God, what does that mean? God is three persons, but one God. It doesn't make sense, how could three be one? Well, there's a movie, an old movie called Nuns on the Run. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's about two mobsters who are trying to leave a life of crime and hide out from the authorities and their mob boss. And once you know, all places they stumble into, it's a nunnery. So they put on habits and they disguise themselves as nuns. And, and I want to show you a clip from the video of this movie. Um, it's one mobster explaining to the other one who has to go to class and the topic of the class is on the Trinity. And the older mobster is a Catholic. He's trying to explain the Trinity to this other mobster who is about to head into class. Now, I apologize for the audio. It's a little bit difficult. And they're speaking in British accents. Okay, so you may be a little frustrated and be like, I can't understand. I'll try to explain a little bit of what they said at the end of the video. But try, try to hear it, okay? But listen to this little interaction that these two mobsters disguised as nuns have with one another. Right now, and, uh... <laughs> so I had a Trinity statement on it. So God was, his last words was, oh, it doesn't make sense. That's why you got to have faith. And you just have to kind of accept it without any real knowledge. Those of you in our apologetics class know that faith and knowledge go hand in hand. But I won't go down that road right now. But it, it kind of highlights a very important point, which the Trinity is confusing, right? It's confusing. They're trying to explain it. And, and I hope that video we showed with Bishop Barrett kind of helped you to see a little bit of what we're talking about when Christians talk about God. When Christians talk about God as Trinity, they're really talking about God as a community of self-giving love. God is a dynamism, not a static being. God is a community uh, of persons. And it's very important for us to see that when we say God is a community of self-giving love, we're not just saying that God loves others, but that God is love. Of course, we're saying more than that, but that's lays at the heart of it. The Christian God is not the unmoved mover of the ancient Greek philosophers. He's not a single monad cold, sterile, impersonal force that emanates itself into reality, but lacks any will or any love. Nor is he some kind of pantheistic organism, energ an energizing sea of energy that is one and the same with the universe. It's kind of a popular way of thinking of God, that God is everything and everything is God. No, God is the creator, separate from his creation, but intimately loving his creation as the Trinity. To say God is Trinity is to say God is love, but love in the Christian sense is about relationship and sacrifice and community. Did you all catch what Bishop Barron said about having to have a lover, a beloved, and a shared love? And that dynamic of community, relationship, and love is made up of three. And so when we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when we see that threeness, what we're seeing is the dynamism and the movement and the flow of love. 
the ancient church came to the conclusion that these three uh, beings, persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, share equally in God's essence and nature. Three persons, one nature. But the higher point is this. I don't want to lose you. That's about as deep as I'm going right there. That was it. But the higher point is this. The Trinity is a way of talking about God that highlights God as a dynamic community of self-giving love. If you touch the Trinity, you're going to get snagged. Like when you snag a sweater on something that's moving. It just gets caught up in it. It gets snagged. You can't embrace the Trinity or come to God understanding that God is Trinity and be passive, immovable, sterile. When you come to the Trinity, you understand that you're coming to a dance. Not a lecture, but a dance. You can't embrace the Trinity without being affected by the love and relationship each person shares with the other. Think about it. If God was just a single person or an impersonal God, that God wouldn't do anything. A lonely, impersonal God does nothing. Nor does that kind of a God require really anything of anyone. But the Trinity, on the other hand, fills us and calls us to dance with the divine, with God, our Father. As some have said, the Trinity points to God as a verb, not a noun. You can take or leave a noun, right? But a verb calls upon you. A verb affects a dance. It's a dance that we are called to enter and experience. So hear, hear this as we bring this to a conclusion. If your vision of God is static, you will be... You'll be static. If your vision of God is lonely and private, you will be lonely and private. If your vision of God is distant and cold, you will be distant and cold. See, the Trinity comes in and breaks all of this and calls us into a community of sacred persons that love one another and calls us into that very same love, to know that we're loved, we are loved, and that we can turn and love others. Or as Willard said, it's being submerged in Trinitarian presence. Entering Trinitarian presence doesn't mean escaping the world, becoming a monk, going out in the woods, living off the land and never coming back into society again or something like that, okay? <laughs> no. It's about living your life, your daily life, more fully with the life and perspective and energy that God can give you. Many things, unfortunately, besides the Trinity, tend to surround us, don't they? Many things are surrounding us these days. Many things we see on social media, hurtful words we keep playing back over and over and over in our heads, things we regret doing, surrounding our minds over and over and over in our heads. This is why it's so hard for churches to make disciples to fulfill Jesus' great commission, to teach others to do the things Jesus said. Why? You can't teach others to do the things Jesus said if you're not living the life that Jesus lived. And the life that Jesus lived was a life caught up in the fullness of who God was and is to this day, to this moment. See, they're not just engaged in that life, the life of the Trinity. They allow soul-withering things, and we all do this, don't we? We're guilty of it. We allow soul-withering things to come into our lives and to create anxiety and guilt and shame. And so we are surrounded, not by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we're surrounded by guilt, hate, anxiety, an unholy trinity of toxic fault. And these are the things that surround our hearts and minds, things like mindless social media videos and posts, things like worrying about our health, Worrying about tomorrow, worrying about the unhappy state of our bodies, worrying about the next thing that needs to get done, or the state of our country, or what's happening in this party, and that party, or with that political issue, and it's all going to, you know where, and you know what. And on it goes. Rather than Trinitarian presence surrounding us, the community of self-giving love, holiness, joy, and truth, and goodness, 
We surround ourselves with darkness, toxic ideas, and unholy images, and our lives become the fruit of that. So what about you? What is surrounding you lately? What is surrounding your mind? Who is surrounding your heart lately? What is preoccupying you? Are you submerged in Trinitarian presence or not? How shall we enter ordinary time, beloved, the rest of this year? How shall we face our worries? How shall we face the challenges? How shall we face our ailments? How shall we face our fears? How shall we face our pain? I want to suggest to you today that it's by submerging ourselves day by day, minute by minute, with the presence of the Trinity. Beloved, our baptism not only marked our life into the Trinity, but it is also a model of our ongoing enjoyment of the lover of your soul and mine, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are so many ways we can begin to enter into this new reality of submerging ourselves into the Trinitarian fellowship with God in order so that we can carry out God's mission. But I just want to leave you with one practice. I want to leave you with one practice this, this morning. It's called St. Patrick's Breastplate. And if you looked in your bulletin, you noticed a little green slip. It's St. Patrick from Ireland, so it had to be green, right? For those of you that are Irish, you can appreciate that. And this was an ancient prayer, I and mean, we're talking, I think, the third or fourth century, I believe. And this is in the midst of a pagan world that was Christianizing. And Patrick had a unique ministry to the pagan people of his day. So if you're reading the prayer, you're hearing things like witchcraft and dark spirits of the night, you know, protection from these things. Understand when it was written. There's a context there. But I would suggest to you that those things are still with us today, okay? <laughs> And, but if some of the language is off-putting or it doesn't work, just skip it. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that you take this prayer and in some way you kind of use it as a meditation tool or just a prayer, a simple prayer that you say every morning. Wake up, put it by your bedside. Wake up and just go through this prayer and read it softly and slowly before you get out of bed. Some of you may want to take it and read it maybe three times. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Take it out. And just read it to bring you back and to center you and to get you to think, whoa, I've got to be engaged with the Trinity. Some of you may want to, you, you may read this and be like, hey, I'll, I'm going to practice trying to pray it throughout the day. Maybe I'll do it one time a day in the morning. Or maybe I'll do the, the three times in, uh, during the day. That'll be great. But some of you may want to say, you know what, I think every, every three or four days or maybe just once a day or whatever, I'm going to sit with this for 10 minutes, 15, 20, no more than 20. And I'm just going to kind of meditate over these words and just sit there in quiet and invite the Trinity to be present to me. I think if we can begin to invite the Trinity by using a spiritual discipline and the prayer of St. Patrick, we'll begin to increase our awareness of God as Trinity and also how the Trinity is walking with us day by day, moment by moment. So prayerful consistency, intention with this practice, and involving all your senses will aid you. I think when you're, when you're reading things too, if you can get your body into it, for those of you that live alone, you can feel free to do this. For others of you, you may feel a little weird if you've got someone else in the house, right? When it says, like, Christ above me, you can do this. I've done this. Christ around me, you can move your arms around you. Christ in my eyes and my ears. Use your hands, get your whole body, make it a full sensory experience for you. And this will help you, invite the Holy Spirit to use these tools to help you go deeper into your awareness, experience of God as Trinity. Let me end by saying the last few lines of this prayer. Christ with you, Christ before you. Christ behind you, Christ in you. Christ beneath you, Christ above you. Christ on your right. Christ on your left, Christ when you lie down, Christ when you sit down, Christ when you arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to us, Christ in every eye that sees us, Christ in every ear that hears us. We arise today through a mighty strength.
the invocation of the Trinity through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. And all God's people say, Amen. Trinity, we give you thanks. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, full of fullness of yourself and the great gift that you offer in giving yourself to us, how we take it for granted. Begin to wash away and scrub away the, the, uh, the, the grin and the grime of self-infatuated idolatry, of sins that so easily ensnare by the worries that we allow to dump into our lives. Clear it all away and give us a deeper vision of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask on this Trinity Sunday for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite at this time our ushers to come up as we take up our offering. Sunday, so we're going to prepare our hearts to take up communion. Uh, so I hope you're ready. Christ our Lord invites us to his table, to all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news, beloved. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Won't you join me as we sing one line from Let Us Break Bread Together.
be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper had ended, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink this, drink it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, God, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour on your Holy Spirit on those who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us to be the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory. We feast together at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with us, the Holy Spirit, in your body, the people, the church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
It's so good to be with you this Lord's Day. I hope your heart was strengthened and encouraged. And now, if you will, please stand and receive this benediction. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen, amen, amen. Join me as we sing our last hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.